Hello and welcome to Socially Holistic Podcast. Socially Holistic helps coaches and holistic entrepreneurs and women in heart-centered businesses make sense of social media so they can build their own online network and get more clients. As a heart-centered business owner, you do amazing work. Holly's mission in life is to help you help more people. Help us help more women in business with a five-star review of this podcast. Please leave one today over at iTunes. The more women who find out about this podcast, the more heart-centered businesses will be successful. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Socially Holistic Podcast, episode 63. This is your host, Holly Wharton, and I'm here with today's very special guest, Michelle DiFilippo from 1106 Design. Michelle is the author of Publish Like the Pros, and she helps self-published authors create beautiful books that look really professional. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you, Holly. It's a pleasure to be with you here this morning, and and I'm looking forward to any questions you and your listeners may have. Excellent. I'm so excited (laughs) because I think a lot of my clients and listeners know that in addition to helping women in heart-centered businesses like coaches and holistic practitioners, I also help authors with social media marketing. So books are something, and particularly self-published books, are something that I've been working with for the last couple of years, and I've really kind of always got in my mind, and I feel like so... So many women in business could really benefit from writing a book that showcases their expertise, but I think a lot of people are still stuck in the idea that they have to find a traditional publisher, and it's just not that way anymore. Oh, no. In fact, so many uh, the, the traditional publishers are looking for celebrities and politicians and authors who already have established a very big platform. Basically, they want authors to do all the work for them. And then they, they just provide the logistics for, the, for those authors to get their books into the bookstores. But that's not necessary anymore. And more and more people are choosing to self-publish and take responsibility for the whole publishing experience and, more importantly, reap all the profits for themselves instead of sharing it with someone else. Exactly. And I think another important thing to call out is that if the book looks professional, first-time readers for an author won't judge the book on the basis of it being self-published because I think a lot of readers don't even notice who has published a book. We know whether it's Penguin or Random House or who knows what. Don't think that's something that people need to be worried about when they're thinking about self-publishing because I I think most readers just don't even notice who's published the book. That's entirely true. And and everyone, including me and including you, we all judge a book by its cover mm. because we can't do anything else. I mean, nobody goes to Amazon and looks at every book and reads every book description. And even when we go to the bookstore, we don't necessarily pick up every book on the shelf on the topic. So there's something about that cover that has to get people interested to learn more. And that is the single job of a book cover. And it has to be competently designed. Now, I, I'm sure we'll get into this later. There's There's all kinds of bad advice available on the internet about how to go into self-publishing and how to go about it. And and one of the biggest mistakes that authors make is not to have a professionally designed book inside and out. Mm, I totally agree with you on that. (laughs) So why don't you start start out by telling us a little bit about your background? Okay. I've I've been in this business for a very long time. My first job was at Crown Publishing in New York, uh, where I designed some some pretty interesting books. And and then I went and I worked at some advertising agencies in the New York area. And when I had about seven years experience, I moved to Phoenix, Arizona, and found out that graphic designers made minimum wage here. So uh, yeah, that was a rude awakening. I didn't know that before I decided to move. (laughs) Uh, I might not have moved here otherwise. Um, So one thing led to another, and I wound up opening a typesetting business in here in Phoenix. Now, typesetting businesses, don't really exist anymore. That was the old-fashioned way of getting words on paper and getting words on a page. And so that lasted from 1980 to 1993. And uh, thanks to Steve Jobs, typesetting businesses just evaporated. (laughs) (laughs) So so that was sort of an interesting experience, but it was a great one in in retrospect because I joined my clients, went out and bought a Macintosh, and and now I'm working on a Mac just like everybody else works on on a personal computer. And then I, and I got back into books again after having a, a sort of a hiatus from books when I was working for ad agencies as a typesetter. I got back into the publishing realm and, of course, now self-publishing in the last 10 years, I would say, has really taken off. And so I'm back where I started in many ways. I love it. And I love how you're helping self-published authors in particular 
get their book together and, and you're kind of pulling all of your experience from all these years into something that's really, really necessary these days. Yes. So was there a kind of a tipping point in your business where things went from struggle to flow? Because I know self-publishing has really, really taken off in the last couple of years, but in recent years there was this whole stigma around it. And so I think a lot of people just weren't, were still kind of uneasy about self-publishing. Yeah, well, well, I don't know. I think every business is always uh, has a push and pull between struggle and flow. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever get from one to the other because there's always challenges to be addressed no matter what business you're in. Uh, but what has happened in the self-publishing field is that it, Dan Pointer, I don't know if you know the name, he, mm -hmm. he essentially invented self-publishing and Self-publishing became possible when Amazon was invented. Before we had Amazon, an author didn't really have any choice except to go to a publisher who could in turn get their book into the bookstore through the traditional distribution channels. Only a publisher could work with a distributor. Well, Amazon changed all that. Now anyone can put their book up on Amazon and, and have access to the very same distribution channels that a publisher would have. So Dan Pointer came on the scene about that time, and he started teaching people how to self-publish, how to get their book up on Amazon. And he taught people the right way to self-publish, which is that the author is the publisher, mm -hmm. the person who owns the publishing business. The author is not necessarily the person who designs the cover or typesets the interior or edits the manuscript or any of those other tasks. Those are tasks, but the business is the business of publishing. And it became more and more popular thanks to Dan traveling around the world. But then the business got hijacked by these entities called self-publishing companies. And, and that's where it has really gone off the rails. And it has sort of been a challenge for me too, because now instead of being able to talk to authors and talk about quality, I now have these self-publishing entities in the background screaming, you know, come over here. We can do it for you for free or we can do it for you cheap. And it really is pulling a lot of authors into an entirely negative direction. And it's responsible for a lot of broken hearts. And, and that's why I was really glad when you reached out to me for this interview, because my business is a heart-centered business. And and I don't know how it could be anything else, frankly. <laughs> I, I mean, I hear all the time that that business is not personal, but I don't know how it can be anything but personal. I agree. <laughs> uh, so, so my whole focus is to to help authors who care about their book to to make it a successful book. By and design is just one piece of that puzzle. Hmm. Now, why don't you explain to us a little bit more about those self-publishing companies? Because I know exactly what you're talking about, and they make my skin crawl. <laughs> yeah. But I think that a lot of our listeners might not know, you know, what that is, and they might not know how to avoid falling into that trap. So, so what is what is a self-publishing company? Well, I, I don't. First of all, I don't. Let me say this: I don't blame authors for for getting sucked into the self-publishing companies because they are great big companies. They mm -hmm. spend heavily on internet advertising. So as, as a person who doesn't know anything about the business, if you go on Google and you type in self-publishing to begin your research, that's all you're going to get the first 25 pages of these self-publishing companies. Um, and so, you know, people naturally just browse these sites and they would be led to believe that this is the way you go about it. But they're really just publishing predators, as <laughs> Judith Bryles likes to say. What they do is they... They take advantage of the fact that most authors don't know anything about publishing and they define this process and they tell them you can lay out your own book, you can use one of our templates to design your cover, and we will make your book available to bookstores nationwide. That's the key word, and we will pay you a royalty. Okay, those two, those two phrases right there are the key words that should chase away any thinking person, because when they say that they're going to make your book available to <laughs> bookstores nationwide, it doesn't mean that your book is going to be on the shelf. It means your book is going to be placed into a database with a gazillion other books, and someone could walk into a bookstore and special order it but it's not going to be on the sh on the shelf right so right off the bat there they're misleading you they're they're playing on your emotions and making you think wow oh, i'm going to be able to go to barnes and noble and i'm going to see my book on the shelf it's not going to happen mm. okay and and of course their advice to design the book 
yourself is completely off base. No book from a major publisher is ever designed by the author. (laughs) <laughs> and and it's just not the way to go. I mean, we all have our areas of expertise, you know. I I couldn't write a full length book. I mean, you should you should see the little book that I wrote. You should see what my editor did to it. She turned my tortured prose into something that's readable. Uh, because I'm trained as a designer, that shouldn't be surprising. I'm not a writer, so it's the same in the reverse. Someone who's trained as a writer, experienced as a writer, doesn't necessarily mean that you can design your book or should even attempt to design your book. So th- that's sort of where the, the self-publishing companies go wrong. But but to go a little deeper into that, why do they do that? Why do they make these emotional promises? to authors and they do it for run- one reason once they've got you sucked into their system then they start upselling you on all kinds of expensive marketing programs that are never going to work i can go into a story if you want sure. right now about one author that i spoke to just a couple of weeks ago very nice man he signed up with a self publishing company he formatted his own cover he formatted his own interior and it was a fi- turned out to be a 50 page what he called a book. Well, 50 pages is a booklet. Mm-hmm. It's not a it's not a book, right? So they just did their thing on him and they said, "We're going to pay we're going to put it up on Amazon for you and we're going to pay you 7.95 for every copy that you sell." Mm. Well, they put it what well, sounds like a lot, right? Yeah. Well, they put it up on Amazon at a retail price of $25. Okay. Oh, right? And then they told him it's going to cost $7 to print the book which it doesn't, it costs $3 to print the book. And then they split the royalty with him to get oh, to that right. se- seven ninety five. And this is what they do. Uh, mm. And it's just, it makes my eyes bleed. <laughs> uh, I, I, I just can't stand how any business could do that repetitively. And they do it tens of thousands of times. Mm. So, so they got his book up there. And of course, it looked terrible and it didn't read well. And of course, it's not going to sell. 50-page booklet is not going to sell for $25. I don't care if you're Stephen King. <laughs> so, of course, it didn't sell. So that's when the fangs come out, okay? Then they told him, well, uh, if you display your if you let us display your book at the, at an upcoming AARP convention it'll sell and they charged him $800 for that mm. and he fell for it and of course it didn't get I don't know if it got displayed or not but it certainly didn't help his book sales any and he was complaining about that and then they said well we can try this other program for $1200 mm-hmm. <laughs> and he went for that and it didn't work either. But but this is not an isolated story. If you spend any time at all on LinkedIn in some of the publishing groups, you can you will find stories from many, many authors who spent seven, eight, ten, I've heard as high as fifteen thousand dollars once the self publishing company got a hold of them. Mm. And and you know, of course then eventually they realize that they're just being played. Yeah. Uh, so, so like you said, it's, it's just a horrible situation. And if I, if I could give people one bit of advice, it would be do not go to a self-publishing company. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So what should authors do instead? Because I know that that can be really kind of tempting because they kind of organize everything for you. They say they're going to take care of everything. And of course, that's a totally different story as we've just heard. But how should new authors be doing it? Okay, well, first of all, they should go into it with their eyes open, okay? Publishing a book is is a difficult thing. It's very it, it's relatively straightforward and easy to prepare the book and get it online, but but that's when the real work starts. You have to market the book, you have to have a plan. And so I think authors should really have an honest discussion with themselves as to whether or not they're ready to step into that responsibility because it does take a lot of time. It can be a full-time job to promote a book. Uh, you know, with, with people like yourself to help, you know, it's it's fine, but it is a big undertaking. It's not as simple as the self-publishing companies describe when they're trying to suck you in. I would recommend that authors be the publisher in in just the way Dan Pointer used to teach all those years ago before everything got all twisted around. You are the publisher. It means you should control everything that happens with your book from the editing to the design to the marketing to the promotion. You you need to have a, a very 
detailed plan and figure out what you're going to do, what you're not going to do, how you're going to afford it, how you're going to raise the money. Big story. It's, it's a big deal to publish a book. Mm. Yeah. And I think an important thing to remind people is that there's so many different things to do. You know, as you've said, the cover design, the interior layout, marketing, website, all of that. But that doesn't mean that you need to do it yourself. You're, if you're not a graphic designer, you should not be doing your own book cover. You need to be hiring people out to do this. Right. And I would say that's even true of the website and the social media because mm -hmm. because we can't be good at everything, you know, and I, w I would say if you do it yourself, you're more than likely shooting yourself in the foot. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, Judith Bryles, who's who is just an expert in the field. She calls it the rush to publish syndrome. Mm -hmm. What what people do is like, well, I have to, I, I have to do it myself because I can't afford to do it any other way. If you find yourself saying that to yourself, then I would say you need to stop and really think about what you, you're planning to do here because it's an important thing to publish a book. You want it to be a good book. You don't want it to be a lousy book. <laughs> and it's possible to publish a lousy book, but it's really not the best way forward if you hope that book to, if you want that book to succeed. And I think one of the important things that you said earlier is how important a book cover is. And there's something that you say on your website that I absolutely love that says, if it looks like a rookie designed it, people assume a rookie wrote it. And that is so, so true. If the book cover does not look like a professionally designed book cover, it's people are just going to assume that the inside is sloppy as well. That's correct. And there is, you know, book covers look simple. Mm -hmm. If you look at the best selling book covers, you it would be easy to look at those and say, well, I can do that. I have Photoshop, I have Word, but there's a lot more involved in it than, than meets the eye. The final product looks great and it looks easy because an expert already took care of all the problems. If you haven't been trained in typography, if you haven't been trained in digital file creation so that you can come up with a file that a printer can print, there's a lot more to it than, than meets the eye. And that's what designers do. That's what we've been trained to do. Exactly. And I think another important thing is to, when you're getting a book cover done, you need to go with a graphic designer who specializes in book cover design, not just a general graphic designer, um, because it's a totally different language. That's exactly correct. There's, there's a lot of graphic designers will think they know how to do a book, but and they may be very talented in brochures and annual reports and business cards and, and that sort of thing. And so it's it, it's natural to assume for them to assume that, well, a book cover is the same sort of thing. All I have to do is make the title big and put the author's name at the bottom. But but there's a certain look to a book cover. And I know that sounds hard to understand, but there's a certain look that a book cover has. And it's in tweaking the typography in this way and that way and experimenting and letter spacing and size and position and color and the image, on the underlying image, it all works together to look like a best-selling book cover. And, and that's really impossible to do if you haven't been trained and you, and you haven't had a lot of experience doing it. Mm. Yeah, I think all you need to do is, to, is Google, I think, bad self-published book covers and you'll, <laughs> you'll come up with a good list of or examples of exactly how wrong a book cover can look. Yeah, yeah. And it's a, it's a, it, it just comes down to your passion for your book. If if you believe in your book, then you need to put your your time, your money and your energy into making it the best it can be. And if you're not willing to do that, well, then maybe you shouldn't self-publish at all. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I agree. And I do think that creating having, you know, a self-published book put together, that's an investment. And you might recoup that investment, you might not. But whether you do or you don't, you need to go into it with the attitude that it's you're it's going to cost some money to have it put together. Well, that's right. And and really if you put together a bad book, if you don't get it edited and you don't have a good design, not just the cover but the interior as well, you really, you have no chance of recouping that investment. I mean, the stories are everywhere of self-publishers who have only sold 50 copies. Mm -hmm. Well, nobody goes into the book business to sell 50 copies, at least I hope not. Yeah. Um, and, and it's true. It is an investment that you may not recoup unless you sell thousands of copies. And that's why you have to start with the plan, start with how who your market is, how you're going to reach them, and then you create the book based on that initial research. You, in other words, you find a problem, 
and you write the book to satisfy the problem. You don't write a book and then hope there's an audience out there. A lot of people get it backwards. Yeah, exactly. People write what they want to write and then don't realize that no one's interested in reading that. <laughs> well, it's it's and it's hard to know. You know, the the questions you need to ask when you when you're planning a book. We did actually published a blog post, a guest post this week on our site from a literary agent, Wendy mm-hmm. Keller. Mm-hmm. And she said that whether you plan to publish yourself or subsidy publish or traditionally publish your book, you've got to start by asking yourself some questions and the, and the first question is who will buy this book and why will they buy it? And after that question is answered, you have to ask yourself, is your book new, different, better than the competing books that are out there? And then are those competing books selling? Because you don't want to design a book and put it among other books that aren't moving. You want a book that's going to sell. Hmm. And all of that should actually be done. All of those questions and more should actually be answered before you even begin writing so that you can target the book to the people you think are most likely to buy it. Definitely. I think that's so important. I think that's even a more challenging for fiction authors because I think people who are in business who want to create a business-based book usually already have an idea of who their ideal client base is. And that's probably going to be the same ideal reader base group as well. That's true. Fiction, I will say this, fiction is a tough sell mm-hmm. uh, bec- because the market is everyone and it's hard to market to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you might say seg- it might be segmented a little bit in terms of, you know, historical fiction or, you know, science fiction or whatever the case may be. But you're still faced with the task of reaching the general public. Mm-hmm. And, and that's really difficult to do. So, Michelle, what would you say are your top tips on how to create a book that looks really professional and that's you know, more likely to sell? Uh, Well, like we already talked about, uh, you have to have a a professional cover design. And when we work on a cover design, we start with research. We look at what the best sellers look like in in that particular genre. And we also go out and we look at the market in terms of what the major publishers are planning to release in the next six to nine months. And there's a reason that we do that because – Let's say your book is on the market and people go to Amazon and they type in your title. Well, Amazon is not just going to show your book. They're going to show it besides all the bestsellers. Mm -hmm. And and so your book has to look like it belongs with those bestsellers. If you emulate the cover design of the bestsellers, now not copy but emulate, then people will, even if they haven't heard of you, they will judge your book to be worthwhile, worth exploring. If your book is designed in some unique way that doesn't go with any of those other books on the topic, they're going to judge it to be risky. So that's the importance of cover design. They may not have heard of you, and that's fine. Many people don't pay attention to the author's name, but your book has to look as competent as the bestsellers in the cover. Now, what else should you do? You should not lay out your book in Microsoft Word. (laughs) I know you think you can. And I know there's a lot of people on the internet who are telling you to do just that, but that is not how a publisher lays out a book. The interior book design process is perhaps even more complicated than the cover design process. There's a lot to know about typesetting, about book page composition, and typesetters do much more than pick a font and set the margins and just let it rip. There's a lot of rules to be followed that make a book look like a book. And not like a word process document. So you should budget for and plan on hiring an interior designer as well as a cover designer. Mm, excellent. And I think that's that's something a lot of people don't think about. And as you said, there are so many little details when you're laying out the interior of a book that if, if it's not your experience, if you don't have experience in that, people would never think about that. I mean, you know, the way the way a sentence ends on a page and just so many little details. And if those details aren't there, the book really looks like someone just typed it up and printed it out on their home computer. Right. And, and that's the thing. See, if you're laying out your book yourself, to you, it looks perfectly fine because you're doing it. <laughs> um, and it does look something like a book. But if you were to take if you were to try this, try this yourself and you were to take your results and go to the library or the bookstore and open up a, a best-selling novel, let's say, that was published, Stephen King, something like that, you will see that the typography on the page of that best-selling book looks a whole lot different than what you can do in Word and your laser printer. 
there's just a whole bunch of science to it that that typesetters do and it's it's incredibly boring sometimes <laughs> i'll be i'll be perfectly honest but you know you get to the point where okay so one of the one of the rules for book design for instance is that you should never have the first line of a paragraph at the bottom of a page and you should never have the last line of a paragraph at the top of the page well Sometimes the, the words don't cooperate. And so then what do you do? Uh, a book designer using you know, page layout software has the tools to take care of those things. You just can't do it in Microsoft Word, at least not easily. It's kind of one, one book designer said, well, you know, can you do it with Word if you try hard enough? Yeah, but it's kind of like hammering a nail with the back end of a wrench. It's not efficient <laughs> and you're probably going to jam your fingers up and, you know, it's just not the way to go about it. And it's just not going to look good. I mean, even if you have InDesign and you kind of know how to use it, it's still not going to look like a professional book because, you know, professional just needs to do it. Well, it's like anything else. I mean, if, if you look back to the first day on, on your job, whatever you do for a living, you certainly didn't do your best work on that first day or even in that first week, maybe not even the first year. So experience and training do matter no matter what job you're doing. And that includes uh, book design. Yeah, definitely. Now, on your website, you have the six steps to publish your book. Can you tell us a little bit about those six steps? Sure. The first step is cover design, which which we, we've just talked about. The second step, isn't this terrible? The second step <laughs> is editing. Okay, you have to have your book professionally edited, not just by someone who knows the language or someone who teaches English or someone who's a PhD, but you should have your book edited by a professional book editor because what they're going to do for you is make sure everything flows, the language is correct, the book makes sense, from start to finish. They just know what they're doing and working on books is a lot different than working on other kinds of materials. So after editing, then we go into the interior design stage. And that's what we've just talked about that too, is that's where you'll work with your designer and, and create, we'll create some samples back and forth with you until you're absolutely delighted with the way the interior of the book looks. So after interior design, then it's time to proofread your book. Now, I know it's been proofread a bunch of times before. I know that you think you don't need a professional proofreader. And at the risk of sounding very redundant, you do. You need a professional proofreader to find all those little things that everyone misses along the way. There is something about formatted book text that makes errors pop off the page that you didn't see before when you were looking at it in Word or on your screen. And plus, a professional book proofreader will follow the recommendations in the Chicago Manual of Style, which is the Bible of proofreading. In that way, we'll make the, the, all of the text consistent in terms of abbreviations and, and how everything is treated. Now, why is that important? That's important because if you send your book out to professional reviewers, they're going to spot those kinds of errors and they're going to pan your book if they think you didn't do your homework and pay attention to these details. So after proofreading, then it's time to talk about how your book should be printed. There's lots of options there, too, depending on how you plan to sell your book. And then, of course, marketing. Always, always marketing. And that's where Holly's skills come in. We have to tell people that your book is available. Exactly. Uh, the odds of someone just kind of stumbling across your book online are very, very slim in the same way that, you know, people probably aren't going to come across your business online unless they're really, really looking or, you know, you're doing lots to actually launch your products and services and get things out there. You know, a book really, really needs to be marketed. And that's something that people often leave to the last minute. They wait until the book's already done before they start talking about it to people. Yeah, and it actually has to start. Uh, it, you can start uh, blogging and, and tweeting about your book as as the process begins. Get get people interested so that when the book is finally available, they can't wait to go out and buy it. Mm. So how, I mean, I know every project is different, and of course, every project depends on what different elements people need, but how much do you think the average person should budget for getting you know, their book self-published between the cover, um, the interior design, <clears throat> editing, all of that. What, what would an average price range be? Well, not counting marketing, which mm -hmm. is different for every everyone. I would say probably two, two, four, probably about six thousand dollars. Okay, you know, 
depending on the book. Now, now we didn't talk about indexing at all. Uh, some nonfiction books uh, need an index in the back, especially if you plan to uh, sell your book to libraries. Sometimes a librarian uh, will accept or reject a book based entirely on the quality of the index. So if your book is a sort of nonfiction book that has a lot of names, places, dates, events, uh, then you'll def- and definitions, for instance, then you'll definitely want an index in the book. Mm. So who uh, does that? I, no, I, you know, I know the indexes are so important, but I've actually never thought about who would sit down and do that. Does the editor do that, or is it a special indexing professional? No, believe it or not, there are indexing professionals, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I could never do it. Talk about a horrible job, yeah. um, but but there are people who who just love to comb through a book and think about what should and should not be included in the index, and it's a specialty unto itself, and it's extremely time consuming. But if it's done right, it's very useful to the reader. Uh, we've all we've all seen indexes that are computer generated and maybe don't take us to the information we're looking for, or we're looking for something and there's no listing in the index for it. Mm -hmm. Um, And that can be very frustrating. So the skills of a professional indexer can also be a big benefit to your book. Very, very interesting. And I think that's something a lot of people would not think of on their own. Yeah. Now, fiction, of course, doesn't need an index. Mm. Um, I've I've had people come to me and say, I've written a novel and I want indexing. Well, well, no, you don't. (laughs) (laughs) No, not not a necessary investment. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, so so we always tell people the truth. We we don't sell them services they that they don't need. Uh, we we're all about producing a really good book that that the buyers will accept and not wasting their money, but also telling them the truth in terms of when they really do need to invest money. Mm. Excellent. So for all of our listeners who are perhaps hopefully um, thinking about writing their own book to help boost their kind of expert status within their niche. How could they benefit from working with you or how can they get started working with you or what would be the next best step for them? Well, it, it depends on where they are in the process. So you can always start with a conversation. I like to start with a conversation, even though we, we communicate electronically all the time now and it's very efficient. There's no there's no substitute for talking to each other, I think. And what we do is we, we make sp- recommendations specific to the situation, okay? And that's another way where the self-publishing companies sell people, you know, the same solution, regardless of what kind of book they've written. It's it's really a machine. But what we do is we try to tailor our recommendations to the author and to the book so that we help them get started in the right direction that's going to meet their goals, not not just some canned response, yeah, I think that's important to have someone that really understands your project and can give you, you know, an estimate and, and advice that fits your book and not just a cookie cutter. That's right. And, and you know, it can be where, wherever you are at the pro- in the process, there's usually we could step in at almost any stage. I mean, if, if you just have a book idea and you, and you haven't even gotten it written yet, we know some ghostwriters we can refer you to. We don't do that. But once you have the manuscript written, then we can start talking about whether it needs copy editing or a substantive edit. Most most books written by business people are already pretty good, and they just need a copy edit. But sometimes people need a substantive edit if they need help, you know, organizing the material or or presenting it in such a way that it's that it's more structured than they're capable of doing themselves. That's where a substantive edit would be helped. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, we move on to the design, you know, edi- editing, design, interior cover design, interior design, proofreading, and and so forth. Excellent. And you also help with author websites as well. Is that correct? Yes, we do. That's a new service that we just started offering this year. And um, it's it's also a good thing to have because even if you – it gives you we, – we design our author websites using WordPress, which gives the author a blogging platform. Mm, so okay. important. Yeah. So the more you can, you get that web, I would recommend getting the website up and running even before the book is ready for purchase, because then you can start talking to people about it. You can start blogging about it as you progress. You know, you tell people we're at the proofreading stage now, or we're doing, you know, the cover design now. What do you think of these covers? There's all kinds of things that authors can do and keep the conversation going way before the book is published. And with WordPress, every time you post a blog, it hits Google. 
Mm-hmm. So, so if you're having a uh, conversation, even with just a few people about your book, someone online who's searching for information may find your conversation, and that may lead somebody that you don't even know to your book. Mm, yes, I think that's so, so important. So, Michelle, there's one question I always ask people on this podcast. Do you have any women business mentors? Are there any women in business who inspire you? And that could also include women in self-publishing that inspire you. Yes, I have. I have some wonderful colleagues. The first one is Judith Bryles. Mm-hmm. She is the she is the owner of AuthorU.org, and she she's a she's the big picture person. Okay, she doesn't get uh, involved in the nitty gritty, but she helps people to to make sense of their book idea. Okay, she she's a coach in the sense that she helps you craft your book and helps you craft your plan to, into a viable publishing project. Okay. Also, I know Amy Collins, who is the owner of New Shelves Distribution, and she can help market your book to the trade. That's Ooh. what she she does. She has contacts. And now I'm not saying she can get every book into Barnes and Noble because that's a steep climb for yeah. anyone. But but she she deals in the trade portion of the book business. And Judith and me and Amy Collins and Georgia McCabe and one other person whose name I can't remember right now are going to be on a publishing at Sea Cruise in January. And if you want more information about that, it's publishing at sea.com. Oh, I like that. Yeah. And there, you know, it's filling up quick. So, so if you're interested, it's seven days at sea in January in the Bahamas, and we're going to teach everybody everything we know about publishing. That's Excellent. I love the concept of that. So it's kind of like a cruise where you get to learn and you get everything you need to know to to get your book self published. Yep, we're going to do we're going to do sessions one session a day. Uh, Not when we're in port. When when we're in port, we're going to let people go have fun. But when we're at sea, uh, we're going to be having group sessions where it's not just one person speaking, but all of us, all five of us are going to be just having a real give and take back and forth session about whatever the topic for that day is. Oh, I absolutely love that. Great, great. I will include links to that in the show notes because I think that sounds very, very exciting. So, Michelle, where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you? Oh, well, you can go to 1106design.com and you should uh, see all the information there on my site. But like I said, I'm always happy to have a conversation or an email. However you want to communicate is fine with me. I'm always happy to answer your questions. And one promise that we do like to make is that we are going to hold your hand throughout the book self-publishing process. So that's what we like to do. I love that. I think that's really reassuring, especially for first-time authors. Yep. Now, where can people find a copy of your book, Published Like the Pros? Actually, I give it away, believe it or not. If, yep. you go to my, if you go to my website, you'll be able to click on the book cover, Publish Like the Pros, and you can download a PDF for free. Um, if you want a print copy, it's available on Amazon. And also on my website, we have uh, weekly tips that we send out to everyone, 52 weekly tips. You'll get a brief email once a, once a week with a little bit of advice in it, and that also is free. Oh, that's excellent. 52 weeks of advice. That's great. Uh-huh. All right. So thank you so much for joining us today, Michelle. I think that you have such a wealth of experience, and I've been secretly following you online for a couple of years now. <laughs> <laughs> have, you, have you really? Yes, I have. So I, I love what you do. You know, I read your book, I don't know, this last year or the year before. I love what you do. I've been reading your blog posts, and so I'm really, really excited to have you today um, sharing your wealth of information. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for the for the opportunity, Holly. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for listening. And remember to visit sociallyholistic.com forward slash SHP63 for the show notes on this episode. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to the Socially Holistic Podcast with your host, Holly Wharton. Please help us help more women in business by giving us a five-star review of this podcast. The more women who find out about this podcast, the more successful businesses there will be. So please leave a five-star review today over at iTunes. Thank you.